There was once a kingdom here, deep in the deserts of China's far west. In ancient times, it was known as Kucha. For more than a thousand years, it was a proud and mighty kingdom. Then, some 1,500 years ago, it suddenly and mysteriously vanished, almost as if it had crumbled into the dust of the desert, leaving behind hardly a trace, save a few weathered and wind-sculpted ruins. To this day, much about this long-lost kingdom remains shrouded in mystery. We do not even know for certain the identity of the people who established this kingdom and where they came from, nor do we know much about their way of life and culture. Intriguing questions also hang over the role this kingdom played as a bridge between the East and West. The story, in a sense, begins in 1889, when a young British man called Hamilton Bower rides into the small town of Kucha. At first, there's nothing strange or suspicious about him. As far as anyone can tell, he's on a hunting trip. But all is not quite as it seems. He's not after big game. Instead, he's on a manhunt. But what he actually finds on this trip changes our understanding of this forgotten, long-lost kingdom forever. A strange sequence of events has brought him here. The previous year, a British explorer called Andrew Dalglish is murdered while traveling from Leh in Kashmir to Yarkand in China's far west. An Afghan by the name of Daud Mohammed is the chief suspect. Word has it that he's holed up somewhere in Kucha. Hamilton Bower, a British army officer, is dispatched to track him down and bring him to book. But Bauer soon finds that tracking down his quarry in the vast wastes of western China is no easy matter. Intelligence, local knowledge, is going to be vital. Word goes out that Bowers is very interested in the whereabouts of a certain Afghan miscreant. So when an Afghan merchant comes calling one day, saying he's got something for Bauer, the young British officer's ears prick up. Imagine his disappointment when, instead of giving him hard information about Daud Mohammed and his whereabouts, Dan presses into his hands a tattered book of incomprehensible scribbles. It won't take him any closer to doubt, but it will cast light on the mystery of the lost kingdom of Kucha. When he gets back to India, Bauer's superiors are also baffled by the manuscript. They pass it on to the Oriental Society of Bengal's Rudolf Hornla. There's something familiar about the strange tadpole-like letters. He realizes it's a version of an ancient Indian writing system known as Brahmi script. This insight allows him to decipher some of the text. Hornla concludes that Bauer's manuscript is a treatise on medicine and divination dating from the 5th century AD. It's a very rare find. Though books made of birch bark were quite common at that time, few have survived the hot and humid climate of India. Prior to Bauer's discovery, only fragments of such books had been found. The completeness of this manuscript makes it a landmark discovery. But the survival of the manuscript raises another question. The arid climate of the deserts of western China account for the survival of this Indian text. What was it doing there in the first place? The quest to find the answer to this question and decipher this strange book leads to a series of intriguing discoveries in Kucha. More scripts turn up. Some are written in languages used to this very day, Chinese, Uyghur, Tibetan, and Arabic. Others, hinting tantalizingly at other long-lost kingdoms and vanished civilizations, are written in dead languages like Sanskrit, Karusthi, Khotan, Moni, and Sogdian. Linguists and scholars are familiar with some of these languages and scripts. Others they manage to painstakingly decipher. The presence of these scraps of writing, using lots of different scripts and writing systems, is a vivid demonstration of the crucial critical role played by the Silk Road in bringing East and West together. It shows that for thousands of years, the Silk Road was not just a conduit of trade, but also of culture. 
Here, a diversity of peoples, Aryans, Huns, Hans, Turks, and Uyghurs exchanged ideas and culture, as well as goods and services. Despite Hornla's heroic efforts, the precise nature of the language the Bauer manuscript is written in remains a mystery. Though the Sanskrit vocabulary used in the manuscript allows Hornla to conclude that it is a treatise on medicine and divination, the presence of unfamiliar items of vocabulary and strange grammatical structures leaves him scratching his head. Yet the distinctiveness of the language raises an intriguing possibility. Perhaps the manuscript contains traces of the original, long-extinct native language of inhabitants of China's far west. There's a possibility that the manuscript contains traces of an unknown language, a language that had apparently disappeared from the face of the earth, the language spoken by the people of the lost kingdom of Kucha. Kucha was a powerful and enduring state. References to Kucha start to appear in annals dating from about 200 BC. By 800 AD, the kingdom of Kucha was no longer mentioned in official chronicles. Xuanzang, a notable Tang Dynasty Buddhist monk, stopped in Kucha on his way to India. He recorded details of his sojourn in Kucha in a book called Great Tang Records on the Western Regions. One thing that caught his eye was the writing system used by the Kuchans. Xuanzang insisted that it was based on an Indian one. Did he see the same script that baffled Bauer, the very script that also struck Hornla as a version of an Indian script? More intriguingly, if it is indeed the same script, what can that tell us about where the Kuchins came from and why they disappeared from the face of the earth? Shortly after the discovery of the Bauer manuscript, another document came to light, a Uyghur script called Maitre Simet. Again, it contains fascinating hints as to the nature of the language spoken by the ancient Kuchins. The Uyghurs migrated into what is now Xinjiang in the 9th century. When they settled in Kucha, they adopted local ways. In particular, they began to practice the Buddhist religion. The Uyghur script, with its explicitly Buddhist theme, is an expression of this devotion to their new religion. However, scholarly examination revealed that it was based on an earlier source. According to the preface, it was a translation of a Tokarian script. It was another layer to the mystery surrounding the identity of the Kuchians. It was a reference to another mysterious vanished people, the Tokarians. Like so much else, it is difficult to say anything about the Tokarians with certainty, but it is generally agreed that this people migrated from the Black Sea to the Tarim Basin eventually settling as far east as Gansu, around 3,000 years ago. Ancient Chinese analysts frequently make reference to peoples who might be identical with the Tokarians. For example, there is some scholarly consensus that the Rocha people, active in Gansu during the Qin and Han dynasties in 200 BC, were Tokarians. Xuanzang mentions the Tokarians in his account of his journey to India, claiming to have traveled through a country called Tokaristan. The ethnicity and identity of the Tokarians has long puzzled and divided scholars. For this reason, many prefer to talk of a Tokarian group rather than a single Tokarian people. In 1907, the German scholar Frederick W. K. Mueller identified the Tokarian language with the ancient Kuchins. The use of the Tokarian language in the vicinity of Kucha seemed to be confirmed when a manuscript was discovered in 1974. It was a Tokarian version of the Maitrasima, lending weight to the claim made in the preface to the Uyghur version that the script was based on a Tokarian original. But what exactly was the Tokarian language? How was it related to other languages? And how was it related to the Kuchin people?
Strange as it might seem, Jin, Sui, and Tong dynasties claim that a royal city with splendid palaces and a thousand temples once stood here. The Uyghurs living in today's Kucha County are predominantly Muslim. It just goes to show how times change. Back in the days of the Kucha Kingdom, Uyghurs were mainly Buddhists. But hardly a trace of this great capital city, a city of splendor and magnificence, is to be seen in today's Kucha region. What happened to it? Archaeologists noted that the walls of some courtyards in Kucha are built around mounds. They asked the locals about them. They shrugged their shoulders and told them they had always been there. But these mounds are not natural hillocks. They're at Tamuli, man-made mounds. But how long have the mounds been here? More importantly, who raised them and why? In what Archaeological excavations of the site confirm that between the Han and Tang periods there was a city here. Though the likelihood is that this is the very city referred to in the chronicles, so far no traces of the palaces and temples have been found. It's as if the city just crumbled into dust. It wasn't until 1978 that clear evidence began to emerge. In May that year, torrential rains caused the river Kucha to burst its banks. Some of the area's important archaeological sites are flooded. When the rains ease off, local experts assess the sites for damage. And the rains have indeed damaged one site. There's a sinkhole at the foot of one of the mounds. When they clear the rubble away and look a little deeper, they discover something of tremendous archaeological significance, a tomb. <laughs> Though the paint had faded, it was still possible to make out a faint diamond pattern on the coffin. For the experts who examined the find, it was an indication that the coffin contained the last mortal remains of somebody extremely important.
But what was the cause of this young woman's death? Thorough examination of the skeleton revealed something very interesting, something that could explain her early death. The upper part of her cranium was strangely flat. What could have given her this deformed skull? And did it have anything to do with her death? However, it soon became evident that trauma did not explain her strangely shaped skull. There was nothing to suggest that a sudden blow had flattened her skull and caused her death. On the contrary, all evidence suggested that a long, gradual process was responsible for the shape of her skull. A few small fragments of bone found inside her pelvis pointed towards a more likely explanation for her early death. Initially, these were thought to be animal bones, possibly the remains of a sacrificial offering made when she was interred. However, closer examination showed that the bones belonged to a fetus, an unborn baby. The young woman had probably died during labor. But the discovery of her probable cause of death only focused attention on her skull. If it wasn't caused by a killer blow, what was it caused by? A possible explanation is found in the Great Tang records on the western regions. They indicate the existence of a curious tradition among the nobles of Kucha. When a baby was born, it was customary for parents to bind its head with two stiff cords. As the baby's head grows, it becomes misshapen. But why would anyone want a child to have a misshapen head? One likely explanation is that a misshapen head is a mark of high social status. Together with the elaborately decorated coffin, it was yet more evident that they had discovered the tomb of a noble. They had also identified the purpose of the huge mounds. They were tumuli, mounds raised to mark the grave of a noble. However, there was a problem. Earlier archaeological studies had apparently confirmed that the mound was not a tumulus, but the remnants of a Buddhist pagoda. It was the first evidence ever found that people had ever been interred beneath a pagoda in what is now Xinjiang. Quite simply, the discovery was unprecedented. The ruins were named Subash, the lost city. The skeleton of the woman is now kept in Kucha Museum. The monk, Xuanzang, who came this way in the mid-600s, records seeing a huge temple of tremendous beauty, which he calls Jahuli, and that it was the first such temple that he had come across in western China. The king of Kuja invited Xuanzang to preach in the temple. He accepted the invitation and stayed for 60 days. Xuanzang is specific about the location of this temple. Could it be that Jahuli refers to a pair of twin temples, each built on opposite sides of the river? Could Subash be the legendary Jahuli described by the Tang Dynasty monk? Subash is located on the terrace north of Kucha, right next to the Kucha River. Right across the river, there is another large ruin.
The ruin on the eastern bank of the Kucha River is as dilapidated as the one on the western bank. Fortunately, the pagoda has survived relatively intact. Evidence that grottos were carved into the weathered walls of the pagoda can be seen. When the pagoda was still in use, these probably housed effigies of the Buddha. Nowadays, most experts accept that Subash and Jauhuli are one and the same. On his way to India to study the Buddhist scriptures, Xuanzang stopped at Kucha. The king of Kucha not only received him with great reverence, but invited him to stay and preach in the city. Is it possible that here, inside these crumbling walls, Xuanzang expounded the teachings of the Buddha? At any rate, Xuanzang writes that when it was time for him to leave, the king of Kucha gave gifts that indicated his reverence for the holy man, and that many monks and ordinary people came to bid him farewell. The literary evidence strongly suggests that Buddhism was Kucha's official religion. If so, it's possible that Subash was the site of Kucha's royal place of worship, the temple where Kucha's royal family worshiped. In 1903, an expedition to Subash led by Count Otani Kuzue, a Buddhist abbot from Kyoto, Japan, makes a great discovery they unearth a Buddhist reliquary. One of the lost kingdom's greatest secrets is about to be disclosed. In 1957, more than half a century after its discovery, somebody notices traces of paintwork on the reliquary. But it's only when the paint is peeled off that an amazing picture reveals itself. Four naked boys, each playing a different musical instrument, are depicted on the lid. Around the side of the box is a vivid dancing scene. A 
According to Japanese scholars, the reliquary dates back to the 7th century. The painting is a depiction of one of the Kucha people's most important festival, a holiday called Sumucha. Buddhism originated in India in 600 BC and rapidly took hold all over Asia. Buddhism probably came to China by the Silk Road. This shows just how important the Silk Road was in Chinese history. It wasn't just trade that flowed down the Silk Road. Ideas and culture came too. As we saw with the Shranzang, Kucha occupied an important position on the old Silk Road. It was a natural place for pilgrims and Buddhist preachers to stop off. The fact that this science of dancing and feasting was painted inside a Buddhist reliquary is significant because it suggests that traditional Kucha culture and Buddhist teachings had blended. A traditional scene of merriment embellishes a box for holy relics. It's a kind of memento mori, contrasting earthly pleasures with eternity, with nirvana. According to the Annals of the Tang, in November 705 CE, Emperor Zhongzong watched the Samuji being celebrated in Luoyang's southern gate. The analyst is particularly struck by one strange custom observed by these exotic foreign dancers. Even though the weather is extremely cold, they douse each other with water. The 3rd century AD, a time when the Chinese of the Central Plains were still unfamiliar with Buddhist teachings, marked the zenith of Buddhism in the kingdom of Kucha. Once the Tokarians settled down in Kucha, their physical features began to subtly change. These are commoners. These are Kucha warriors. This is a Kucha king and his queen. From these religious wall paintings, painted about the 4th century AD, it would be very difficult to identify their ethnic group. Kucha's Kizilgaha grottos are composed of 614 grottos scattered over nine different locations. The murals found here depict Kucha Buddhism at its height. The Russian explorer Peter Kuzmich Kozlov reaches Subash in 1898. Although his expedition unearths a cache of relics, what really captivates him is a huge stone he finds in the East Jehuli Temple. Much to the resentment of his laborers, who are unable to see anything of value or significance in this vast lump of rock, Kuzlov insists on taking the stone with him. Eventually, he manages to cajole his men into breaking the stone in two, and with the aid of a few horses, dragging the pieces back to Kucha. But though his men are understandably resentful as they sweat under the strain of dragging two huge lumps back into town, Kuzlov knows something they don't. He's been doing some reading. Xuanzang's Great Tong records on the western regions mentions a cream-colored piece of jade, more than two feet in length, in the East Jahuli Temple. This piece of jade is supposed to bear the very footprints of the Buddha himself. It's one of the holiest treasures of the Buddhist world.
Kuzlov believes he's found that piece of jade. He's determined to get it back to Russia, whatever the cost. But when the rock reaches Kucha, an old jade carver hears about it. He knows nothing of its religious significance, but knows a top quality piece of jade when he sees it. He successfully enlists the support of the local government to prevent the piece leaving the area. Kuzlov has been outfoxed. Without the cooperation of the local authorities, there is no way he can get his jade out of Kucha. With time short and another expedition beckoning, Kuzlov reluctantly leaves the jade behind. The following year, Kuzlov returned to China in search of the fabled lost Tangut city, known in Mongolia as Karakoto and in Chinese as Blackwater City. His successful identification of the site of the ruined city won him fame in the worlds of archaeology and exploration. Lauded and showered with honors, such was his international celebrity that he never made it back to Kucha to follow through on his earlier discoveries. Word has it that the piece of jade Kuzlov found was left in the courtyard of the Kucha County office until 1964, when it was wrapped up and shipped to the Beijing Museum of Natural History. However, there is no record that Beijing Museum of Natural History ever received this priceless piece. To date, searches of their extensive collections have failed to turn up anything corresponding to the jade piece removed from the Kucha site. Rumors, though, abound of the true whereabouts of the jade. A local antiques dealer claimed that he saw two pieces of jade lying at the bottom of a ditch. He naturally left the priceless fragments where they were. Sadly, a local merchant was not so scrupulous. With the help of a winch, he got them out of the ditch and they disappeared into the blue. However, the truth is that the stories about how people prevented Kuzlov getting the jade out of the country are largely fanciful. The craze for archaeological exploration in China meant that numerous Chinese antiquities were smuggled out of the country. More often than not, there was nothing ordinary people could do about it. Stories of how local heroes guarded the treasure need to be taken with a large pinch of salt. As a precious stone, the jade was of limited value. What made it priceless was its religious and historical significance. The jade piece can be seen almost literally as the stepping stone by which Buddhism made its way from India to China. However, for Buddhists, there's one thing that matters far more than jade carvings and temples, the sutras. The challenge for a country that has just adopted the Buddhist faith is to make sure people can understand them. They need to be translated. Kumarajiva, a Kuchin Buddhist monk and scholar, became a noted translator of Buddhist scripture. Xuanzang is perhaps the most famous Chinese Buddhist monk. His 7th century translations of the Buddhist scripture from Sanskrit into Chinese are considered classic. However, the name of Kurum Jiba, who translated the same Buddhist scriptures three centuries before Xuanzang, is less well known. The purpose of Xuanzang's journey to India was to study the Buddhist teachings in their country of origin, India. Kumarajiva, however, made an equally important journey in the opposite direction. In 68, Emperor Ming of Han Dynasty sponsored the construction of the White Horse Temple in Luoying. It can be seen as the first Buddhist temple in China's heartland. However, questions remain unanswered. Nobody knows exactly when or how Buddhism first entered China. What is almost certain is that Buddhism entered the west of China via two routes, to the south through the Pamirs and Khotan to the north by means of Kashgar and Kucha. The geographical proximity of Western China to the then Buddhist heartlands of Central Asia and India means that the religion almost certainly took hold in the West before it arrived on China's central plains. 
This has important ramifications. The translation of Buddhism to the central part of China via the Far West, rather than by direct contact with India, meant that the Buddhist sutras were transmitted in translated form. By the time they were translated into Chinese, they had been translated several times already. The Chinese versions were inaccurate and corrupt translations of translations. The cultures and states of China's Far West did not suffer from the same problem. Firstly, the languages and writing systems they used were directly modeled on Indian ones. Secondly, ethnic and cultural affinity with India helped to minimize corruption of the texts. Chinese Buddhism was sorely in need of a master who understood the cultures of India, China's Far West, and China's Central Park. Kumarajiva's father, Kumarayana, was the son of a chief minister of one of India's princely states. In the 4th century AD, he crossed the Pamirs and arrived in Kucho, where he became a priest to the royal family. The king's sister, Javaka, also a pious Buddhist, married Kumarayana. Javaka soon fell pregnant. It was said that while she was with child, she would often come to Soji Temple in Subash to listen to the Buddhist teachings and memorize the Buddhist texts and sutras. In the fullness of time, she gave birth to a boy. She called him Kumarajiva. One day, Javaka noticed the graves and burial grounds that littered the outskirts of the city. Suddenly, she became acutely aware of suffering and the brevity of human life. The result was a spiritual awakening. When Kumarajiva was seven, his mother, Javaka, became a nun. He accompanied her to her priory, the Saudi Temple. Ever since his earliest childhood, Kamarajiva had displayed extraordinary insight into the Buddhist scriptures. After two years' study in the Sholi Temple, his mother decided that he needed more advanced instruction in the Buddhist scriptures. She took him to Kashmir. On his way back to Kucha, three years later, he journeyed through Tokharistan to Kashgar, where an arhat predicted a bright future for the boy. He was destined to spread the word of the Buddha far and wide. Buddhism was founded in 600 BC, but it wasn't until 100 BC that Mahayana Buddhism appeared in northwest India. After that, Buddhism divided into two branches, Mahayana and Hinayana. While Hinayana branch emphasizes the liberation and enlightenment of the self, Mahayana tradition stresses the goal of complete enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. When Buddhism entered Western China, the Mahayana tradition came in from the south via Khotan, while in the north, places like Kucha adopted Hinayana. In his early years, Kumarjiva's spiritual influences were almost entirely those of the Hinayana branch. However, all that changed when he went to Kashgar. There, he met monks of great learning who introduced him to the Mahayana tradition. He began to waver between the two. Chumulsa when Kumarajiva returned to Kucha, he began to preach Mahayana Buddhism. Since Hinayana was pervasive in Kucha, there was a lot of resistance to his preaching. However, Kumarajiva was known above all for his eloquence. Soon he persuaded many monks to follow him. He even converted the Kucha royal family. 
Both of these factors were decisive in tipping the balance in favor of Mahayana Buddhism, and it soon took hold among the people as a whole. The Mahayana teaching advocated a proactive attitude to life. Spiritual endeavor was about more than securing personal liberation and enlightenment. It was this attitude that drove Kumar Jiva out into the world and won him fame in the whole of Western China. However, young Kumara Jiva was haunted by two predictions made about him. Another prediction came from his mother. After the fall of the Western Jin Dynasty, China became divided into 16 petty states, all warring with each other. Emperor Pu Jian of the former Qin Dynasty attempted to bring together not just the Central Plains, but also the Western Kingdoms and states. In 383, he ordered General Lu Huang to launch an expedition to Kucha. The emperor was a Buddhist himself and instructed Lu Huang to send him Kumarajiva the moment his conquest of Kucha was complete. Lu Guang's army soon reached Kucha. Kamarajiva tried to persuade the Kuchian king to open the city for the sake of peace. His entreaties were rejected. The king chose to fight with Lu Guang. His army was soon defeated. When General Lu Guang captured Kamarajiva, he began to sense that the prophecy told about him was about to come true. He was on his way east. However, General Lu Guang didn't send Kamara Jiva to Chang'an immediately, as Emperor Fu Jian commanded. In the first instance, he didn't recognize the value of Kamara Jiva. Secondly, but perhaps more importantly, he had become addicted to Kucha wine. Lu Guan was a drunkard. He had no time for Buddhist ideas and their practitioners. Instead, he liked to amuse himself by forcing them to violate the principles of their faith. He took great delight in forcing Kumara Jiva to drink wine, a violation of his vows. When he locked the pious monk in a room with a Kucha princess, nature took its inevitable course and his vows of chastity were broken too. He remembered the prophecy made by the monk on the road to Kashgar. He thought it was the end of his Buddhist spiritual life. One year later, General Lu Guang finally decided to take Kumar Jiva back to Chang'an. However, when they reached Liangzhou, news came that Emperor Fu Jian had been killed in a battle. The dynasty was finally at an end. General Lu Guang's response was to make himself king of Liangzhou. Lu Guang didn't have to take Kamarajiva to Chang'an now. 
But, drunker though he was, he was clear-headed enough to appreciate Kamarajiva's intelligence. He made the monk into his oracle, a fortune teller who would interpret the dreams of this usurper and tell fortunes. For 17 years, he was the king's fortune teller. During that time, he stopped practicing and preaching Buddhism. Yet some good came out of his long sojourn in the court of the king. He mastered the Chinese language. Now, potentially, there was a Buddhist scholar who could bridge the gap between East and West, a scholar who understood Sanskrit, Kuchian, and Chinese. After the former Qin dynasty was overthrown, the new ruler made repeated pleas to Lu Guang to free Kumarajiva and send him east to Chang'an. After this plea was repeatedly rejected, in 394, Emperor Yao Chang, a Buddhist, waged war on Lu Guang. Emperor Yao won, and Kumarajiva was finally on his way to Chang'an. This is Taotang Temple, 50 kilometers from Xi'an, known as Chang'an to many dynasties. In 401, Kumarajiva arrived here, not as a captive, but as a guest. Emperor Yao Chang made him a royal priest. He not only took on 800 students, but more importantly, began to preach Buddhism, the length and breadth from China. Although by that time, already in his 50s, Kamarajiva displayed incredible energy. Under his supervision, a total of 74 books and 392 volumes were translated. Kamarajiva's translation set the standard for later Chinese Buddhist scripture. They're characterized by clarity, fluency, and smoothness. Most importantly, they rectified the errors of earlier editions. Although he was a monk born in India and who grew up in Kucha, Kamarajiva had a distinctive yet attractive style of Chinese. Many of the terms he coined became part of everyday Chinese conversation. On July 15th of 2011, the monks and followers of the Shingonji Temple, Tokyo, come to the Taotong Temple in Xi'an to pay tribute to Kumarajiva. It is a testament to his influence. His translation of the Lotus Sutra is still in circulation among Buddhists to this very day. In 413, at the age of 70, Kamarajiva died in Chang'an. It is said that when his body was cremated, his tongue remained unburned in the fire. His followers then remembered a prophecy he made about himself. If my translation of the sutras are free from mistakes, when I am cremated, my tongue will be unscathed. Buddhism has had a huge effect on Chinese culture. Kamarajiva's contribution was like a breath of fresh air for Chinese Buddhism, helping to assimilate the religion and make it an integral aspect of Chinese culture and tradition. There was never peace for long on the Silk Road. For Kucha, occupying as it did a strategically vital position on the Silk Road spelt trouble. The kingdom was constantly under threat. So what does the king of Kucha do to save his kingdom when he finds it under attack? And what happens to Guoxin, the great Tang Dynasty general, when he leads an expedition against Kucha? Join us for the next part.